Yes, it's true. I got into Harvard at 55. What? Like it's hard? Just kidding. Um, I know it's really bad, I know. But I am wearing a sweatshirt for a reason, and if you want to stick around to find out to the end, please do so to learn about myself and about 24 other creators who have been part of a little tiny Harvard journey. So anyway, what I want to talk about today is really this idea of how to truly know yourself and why it's so important to know who you are. I've come across so many people, and this includes myself, who in different stages of life or their entire life don't really know who they are and therefore they don't know what to do next. They often get stuck in decision making. Should I go get this degree or try that job or, or create this painting or whatever it is? And we can get so frozen in our fear and our lack of identity or not doing it right or just like being truly shy or afraid to try new things that we can get stuck. And so I wanted to share, I'm gonna make some more videos as I mentioned earlier this week on confidence and on like what to do next if you're stuck. But I really wanna to share today about how to know yourself, especially if you had childhood trauma. I think that we often create identities for ourselves based on our stories. And in part, those identities are true, but they don't necessarily make room for the entire picture being painted of who we were, who we are, and who we hope to become. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about kind of where this comes from and then we're just gonna go into, I think it's like 22 steps for you to work on if you want to know yourself more, to take a deeper dive into who you are and potentially maybe use that information to change your life, your story in some way. First of all, I wanna acknowledge that who we are is really sort of a combination of a million different little things from what happened to us in vitro, right? To generational trauma, to the race, the culture, the socioeconomic status, the religion or not, the continent, the country, the state, the city, all of these things alongside temperament and genetics and biology really create the core of nature and nurture having a profound impact on our lives. And I don't wanna get into the debate about how much, I just know that Certain things like with my four children, like they came out in sort of who they are now that they're almost all adults. Their temperament, their general sense of who they are was always there. But because of things like divorce and trauma, there was a, an, uh, a point in time where it changed who they could have become. And I saw it. And so I want to make the you know, make the statement that it does matter what happens to us. And I know terms like resilience and all that can get annoying. But, um, and I don't want to minimize our trauma to like, oh, look how resilient you are. Because even when my therapist says that sometimes it's like, oh, don't say that, you know? But at the same time, like, I'm like, yeah, say that because it's true. If I didn't have this piece of myself, I wouldn't be here. And I do want to talk in another video about like what it takes to find yourself even more. This is just about, this video is about knowing yourself more, okay? So number one is what are the automatic thoughts you have about yourself when I say, who are you and do you know yourself? Where do you go with that? You know, do you go into childhood? Do you go into who you wish you were? You know, oftentimes it's a very negative lens. It's either we, we, we know we didn't have this experience or we'll never have that experience, but like challenge yourself is like when you first get asked the question, what do you think? Number two, how do you think your parents would describe you? Because the issue here is so much of who we are oftentimes is poured into us in good and not great ways by our parents. If a parent says, oh my God, you're so lazy all the time. You're so stupid or what's wrong with you? You know, we've all, we all have parents and I always say it, we all say things we wish we didn't say. Um, but the core is when you get this repeated message, or even like one time a parent can say it at a really profound turning point in your life. But I think that the less secure attachment you have, the more, the more sensitive you might be to a parent's words. But even still, how would your parent describe you, okay? And does that match up to how you see yourself, how you'd like to see yourself? The issue here is how much has that colored what you think about yourself or knowing yourself? Number three is how much of what the parents said about you have you just taken to be the truth about your core self and not challenged? 
have you challenged that? How much of it have you absorbed and just presumed to be true? Number four, what is the reflexive belief, kind of going back to your automatic thought about, you know, do you know yourself? But like, what are the core things when you think about knowing yourself? What do you just go to? Do you go to, you know, mm, not that worthy, not that lovable, kind of smart, kind of dumb? Like, where do you just sort of go into these things that you just never actually sat down and thought about who you are at the core? and trying to look at yourself from the lens of who you, your best self, and also when you're not your best self, right? All those things are parts of who you are and they're all okay. Number five, who sees you in your life? Like who actually knows who you are? I've said this to my kids uh, as the years have gone by, especially around conflict um, in terms of parents when you have high conflict divorce and things like that and narcissism. It's so true that whatever happens with your kids as they grow, eventually they see it. They see our good parts, our bad parts, the places where we don't know how to grow. And you can say what you want all day long about parents, to the about, you know, to a child about the other parent. And of course that can do damage. I'm not saying it can't. But at the end of the day, just like people show you who they are, your parents show you who they are. And even though you can't always see it in childhood, by the time you've reached, I think about 1920, you're really beginning to grasp. And so I always say to my kids, you know, when something is said, you know who I am, good, bad, or ugly, you know, you know who I am. And I firmly feel really good about that because they know where I struggle. They will tell you about the boundary thing I've mentioned, right? Um, so yeah, like who sees you? And ideally we want our partners, our parents, our kids, as they grow, our friends to really see us. But oftentimes we're surrounded by people who can't see us, who won't see us, or we won't let ourselves be seen. We have that defensive protective wall up. Maybe it wasn't safe to be seen. And so your challenge is just finding ways to peek out and more and more bring your full self into life, into the world. Number, th uh, number six, uh, who told you who you were? Who are the people that you think in the negative way have most wounded your sense of knowing who you are or discovering it? Is it parents? Is it partners? Is it bullies? Is it your first crush or love? Is it friendships? There's a lot of damage that happens in friendships. And I, I, I still want to make videos about this because I think when you have complicated parenting figures, it makes friendships really difficult. And this is not something that I fully realized in myself even until the last few years in therapy because there just wasn't space to explore that. But it's come up more and more. And as much as I don't want to admit it, having a mother um, with these issues that I've talked about on many of my videos who struggled has at times colored the way I've showed up in friendships, what I've expected or not, what I've accepted or not, and just in general how I've let myself be or not be in terms of guarded or not. And so that's really impactful. Maybe there was a bully who just you know kept telling you that you were short or you weren't smart or whatever and i as i've said a lot of these even bullies in your own friend group i've seen this most with my daughter but i've seen it with my boys too where people in your own friend group are some of the ones that say the worst things to you and that's even harder because you're more apt to believe those so you want to look at those and begin to challenge where those those adjectives those narratives those stories came from and then and then try to create a different version that is more accurate about who you know that you are the next thing is, have you had experiences or traumas that you let create a narrative or event about you? So as I've talked about, um, in some ways I always thought deep inside though, I, I never acted this way. It took me years to understand, probably in my 40s somewhere, that inside, no matter what I was doing, whether I had a doctorate or a master's degree or had made good decisions, that deep inside I was still the little girl from the apartments who lived in her first house at, in fifth grade and who had unstable parents. And I had a lot of shame about that because I was alone a lot. It was definitely a Gen X neglect situation in terms of just being alone, let alone the lack of predictability and safety from my parents. And so deep inside, no matter what the outside looked like, I think for a long time I believed that that's what I was. And I had a shame about that. I didn't want to be that. I always, I've made many videos talking about how, you know, I wanted to be the Martha Stewart, you know, back in the day with the perfect house and the nails and the car. And at some point I had that and then I lost all of it. 
And when I was in it, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be either. And that's a whole other video. But the point is like when I was in that, I was like disowning the parts of myself that was that little girl. And so I would be jealous or triggered or things it, things just wouldn't be enough in some, at some places. I always measured up. My house was this big. My, you know, the, the parents in the private school's house were this big or the public school, whatever. It was like really messed up, but I couldn't seem to, it was like never enough because I didn't feel like I was enough. So it didn't matter what I had. And then when I became a divorced mom, you know, unexpectedly with four children who were so little and I had basically full custody and had been a stay-at-home mom after getting a master's in psychology for like 10, 12 years, I had completely lost who I was. And so in the early years of my divorce, I would trauma dump to strangers. It's embarrassing now. <laughs> Compassion for myself, these poor people, because I felt so guilty. Like people would say, I have my kids and they were super little, like four little tiny blonde babies from the age of one to nine were like in the mall. And people would say things like, oh, I hope there's a dad helping you out. Or um, are they all yours? Which was so ridiculous. Me being an only child and wanting a big family, like the opposite thing of what I wanted was to ever be divorced. I had so much shame about it. And so I was always trying to explain it. Like I would tell the story. Well, this is what happened, you know? And it was a pretty, it's a pretty gruesome story. It's not like, oh, he had an affair and I left. Like no offense to that because that's devastating. But people kind of go, okay, like they haven't, they have an understanding of like what that might mean for you. But when you have a story that is like not normal at all, maybe someday I'll share it. Um, it was traumatizing. It was so traumatizing. And it was just one of those things where for a long time I felt embarrassed about it. And now I know that that is not my identity. I actually feel really proud of myself. Like I'm so proud of myself that I raised these four kids on my own and it was far from perfect. Um, and traumatic and painful and hard and they've had their own stories and pains and I wish they didn't but I'm also really proud of myself that I somehow survived it because as I look back at all the mom content right now I'm watching with younger moms and I forget like you forget when you're in it how it's just it's devastatingly difficult I think to be a parent in so many regards even when your kids get older and I'm rambling but it is really hard to be a parent and especially in those years when they, they're not self-sufficient or they're taking risks and they're in their teenage years. It's just really hard or they have mental health issues. Um, all of that's hard. Anyway, so how have your stories, experiences and traumas shaped who you think you are, right? So you don't necessarily know who you are. We want to honor those things though. They have shaped us and we can't disown them. They are an important part of our story. And sometimes we're defining ourselves by those losses, those tragedies, those traumas. And that is a piece of our story. It's not our whole story, right? The next thing is we often have defenses that we engage in to sort of reinforce these stories, right? So it's like, well, you know, I'll minimize, deny, blame, whatever it is, because I don't want to own the parts of me that were, that are actually traumatized and hurt. And so I may, I might act in ways, for example, somebody might be, you know, go through an angry phase where they were hurt from their trauma, their loss. And now they think they're an angry person, but really they're not even doing that anymore. It's just a part of like where they were at that time in life, things like that. So what are you doing? Are you projecting? Are you gaslighting yourself? Are you isolating yourself? Are you minimizing your pain? How is that related? Number nine, do your beliefs match how you show up in this world? So for many of us, we say we're this thing, but when we look at, you know, other evidence, it's not the case. For example, if you're telling me that you're someone who is a loving person, right? And you have it all over your social media, you know, live, laugh, love, forgive, whatever. And then you post mean comments on people's media. Well, are you really what you're saying you are? Like there's a, there's an incongruence there. Not that we can't sometimes be jerks and also be good people. But my question is like, or if you have a religious belief that says that you, you know, everyone deserves love. Are you living and loving and advocating that way in the world for people? Or are you judging and, and being the ultimate judge? Like if you want to do that, go ahead. But I really think you're doing yourself a disservice because you're cutting yourself off from yourself from the parts of yourself that might be uncomfortable with these different things in the world that you don't necessarily like or agree with, but maybe you're hurting other people, uh, other people's rights or beliefs in the process of doing that. And so I just ask you, if you think you know who you are, does your life mostly align with the principles? Or you say you're a good person, but you're cheating on your wife or your husband. 
and you're justifying it and and with all due respect like whatever that is there are lots of reasons why people have affairs but at the end of the day you say you're a person of integrity are you really right it's like maybe not and if you need to work on that then go deal with it i mean but my point is that this sort of cohesiveness we it's going to make it really hard to like not just discover who we are but have some love for who we are if we're literally living in and doing things that are really contrary to who we want to be and who we are. The next thing is, is where do those beliefs come from, right? Did you develop these beliefs as a result of your own inquiry? Are they just passed down beliefs from your parents or family or the neighborhood or the school you went to? Like, it's important to lay out everything that you've learned and been exposed to and ask yourself, okay, well, what of this do I align with and what do I not? And how am I going to make that known or not? And I know in this world, I don't share a lot of things in some regards because I, I'm too soft to deal with a lot of the negative content. And I also have to protect my own family and from, first, from a safety perspective, first and foremost, which is why I don't really talk a lot about my kids. There's so many good stories to tell, but it's important that, that you're looking at sort of how you show up and where your beliefs come from. And you can decide, like I'm saying, to share them or not, but are you, even in the quiet, secret moments of your heart and life, are you living according to your beliefs? Or do you need to know what they are? Go, go learn more about things. If you're like, I don't really know what I believe about politics, for example, or religion, go research it. Uh, it's pretty easy with the internet today, right? Okay, the next thing is seek meaning and not happiness. And so I think we have this idea that, you know, we're just like these little like dopamine seekers. We're trying to always find the next hit and find joy. And for many of our brains, that's just how we're wired. But I, when you ask people, like I was doing a research on this and, they're, and a lot of the questions said like, what makes you happy? And I thought, well, this isn't a good question because a lot of my clients will say, I don't really know. I don't really know. And part of the journey is figuring that out, especially if you feel lost. But I would say something like, seeking meaning. Does this feel meaningful to me? Is this a meaningful way for me to spend my time? Do I get something out of it? Sometimes that can be a better like guide than does this make me happy? Research, reading, exploration. And I just basically said that. Go learn. Go learn. If you don't know things about yourself or the world, go learn them so you can create a better sense of who you are. Number 13 is do your inner critic work. Understand that trying to figure out who you are is definitely related to, especially if you had childhood CPTSD or any, any kind of trauma, frankly, but especially a relational trauma, oftentimes that inner critic is just right there ready to just like beat you up so that the rest of the world um, can follow behind and to protect you, right? If I, if I tell you this looks bad or you're acting stupid or whatever dumb, then maybe you won't embarrass yourself. And remember, if you embarrass yourself, you're not perfect. And if you're not perfect, you don't deserve love. See where that went? So that's important. The next thing is to get quiet mindfulness, journaling, uh, meditation. A lot of what we do is we go from now, you know, the TV on to our phones on, to the car on, to a podcast. And I know because I get overstimulated with my anxiety and other issues that sometimes, especially since I turned probably in the late 40s, I used to love to listen to different, you know, podcasts and things in the car. And I still do that. But when I was, especially when I was doing a work commute, it made me more stressed. Like I just needed the quiet of my, of driving home in my own thoughts to kind of calm down. And when we do that reflective work, a lot of truths come to our mind, our heart, sometimes memories and, and pains and hurts do, but it's important to do that work. The next thing is that you want to understand that doing is what creates the change. I'm gonna come back to this at the end of this, but you know, if you watch this video, but you do nothing else, like that's still something. But if you find little ways to take action, you're going to find that life will reveal itself to you more and more. The next thing is you can do is something like an exercise where you draw yourself. It could just be a stick figure. And then try to choose adjectives that describe who you are to know who you are. And they might be conflicting sometimes. You can just Google like adjective lists of personality traits, for example. I think I have these in my courses, like I attach the adjectives. But the bottom line is that trying to like look at yourself and imagine that's me. Like that is me. They're one and the same. How do I see myself? Try to have love when you do it too. Don't just pick out the negative things. You might decide the things you want to work on. That's great. Maybe re this reveals those things to you. But try to have a, a sort of like loving, wise mind taking the whole part of who you are in and going back to not all those negative statements that you might have heard in childhood. The next thing is to um, what, ask yourself, what stories do you tell yourself? 
and write examples, at least one example for those stories. So if the story is, I am selfish, then write a story about how you're selfish. If the story is, or the adjective is, I am loving, write a story about that. If one is, I am resilient, write a little, you know, a little memory about that. You want to give yourself support sometimes to have like, oh yeah, I did do that thing. I did do that. Because what we mostly do is minimize the achievements and the positive things. And we really focus on the things that we're not. The next thing is to, you know, be willing to write down if you could just have anything, have anything you wanted. What are your dreams? Like, don't limit yourself. Go crazy. But the next thing is, let your dreams be there to guide you, but also try to have some objectivity and realisticness about it. That being said, I do believe that anything is possible in most situations. It really is. But there's a place and time, and I think sometimes people can get stuck in not growing because they weren't able to take certain risks, risks in their earlier life. And now as they've gotten older, there's just some things that are just either too impossible or too hard to do. And so you want to just kind of like, maybe you talk to some people in the field if you have a dream. You go get some advice. You watch videos on YouTube. You seek out those who are informed. And then you decide. Maybe your assessment of your dreams isn't a good one because you're just so negative and hard on yourself. But maybe you talk to people or you like, what, what, what would the path take? And could I actually do that? Things like that. The last things are to really think about how would you like to know yourself? How would you like to see yourself? Who are you when no one's looking, right? It's about asking yourself these questions. Write a new story for yourself. If you said, from this day forward, I'm going to seek parts of knowing myself, and this is how I'm going to do it, or these are the goals I have, or these are the roadblocks I want to overcome. Every time you do that, you're leaning into discovering who you are. And the last thing is this. If you do not do something, nothing will change. You, you cannot sit and think your way through self-love, and through, you know, all of these issues, there's only so far your brain can take you. And then you have to do things. And I truly believe this. This is what I talk about in reparenting, is that a lot of it is setting up my life in a way that says, I matter. Because I didn't feel like I mattered in childhood, a lot of my reparenting is about saying no or saying yes and setting boundaries and things like that. So you have to take some action, not a massive one, but you have to find a way to move forward. If you have to hire an accountability coach, uh, a trainer from your gym, if you have to find or enroll in a course, right, whatever it is, if you need accountability and support, figure that out because I know it's hard by yourself. But you have to do something. So that brings me to the end of this, which is that my little Harvard sweatshirt here, and I'm gonna make content for TikTok, is that Harvard reached out, Harvard Public Health, and asked myself and 24 other amazing creators on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok to join their mental health summit this last month and a half or so. And we've been listening to incredible scholars and, and um, just really very informed people about a range of topics from maternal mental health to racism to how are we going to navigate truth in what we read and see with all of the AI technology. And so I'm going to try to find some ways to incorporate what I've learned and, and to share here and on TikTok. But my point is that like, I don't know, I certainly wouldn't have expected that. It's just a little thing. But I think the greatest thing was the first day we had the seminar, another colleague asked, hey, you know, they were giving us the how things are gonna go. And she said, can I ask how you chose us? And the summit leader said something like, well, the, you know, the Harvard students went, went through all these profiles and accounts and chose you. And so, I don't know, that just felt really good, right? It's something that I would never have expected, especially making content at this age. It's been really difficult for me, and I have struggled. If you watch my earlier videos, you know how fast, how fast, how fast I talk sometimes. And, you know, it's been a journey, but I had to be willing to do something. And I knew I could do it. I just didn't know it was going to take this long, but I just kept showing up. And that's the whole thing, is you take a step, and then you keep taking the steps. Not perfectly, not always, but generally consistently. And I promise you, if you keep taking steps forward and you open your mind to, to releasing yourself from often the prison of who you've been told you are, you are truly free to discover and have compassion for not just who you were, who you are now, and who you hope to someday evolve and to continue to be. Thanks for being here. I hope this was helpful. I know I talked more than I managed, more than I managed. I know I talked more than I planned to, but I just, 
I'm excited about this topic because I think that I know so many of you and like myself, we get through periods where we're stuck. And even right now, I'm like, hmm, you know, okay, I've gotten here. What do I want next for myself? Especially as my kids are almost out of the nest. It's a huge turning point. What do I want in my career? What do I want in my personal life? And if we're not asking the questions, we're not gonna discover the answers. But it is important that you know that who you are is someone worth knowing. But it has to start with you. So thanks for being here. Like I said, stay safe and well, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.